Today you're about to learn a must know opening trap in the Queen's Gambit and even more importantly, three unknown ways to use this trap against beginner, intermediate and advanced level players. Let's rock! Hopefully you're aware of the main trap of the Queen's Gambit, so we'll go over it real quick. White here wants to gambit this pawn on c4 and as black captures it, white plays e3 trying to get the pawn back and kind of baiting black in trying to hold on to this extra pawn by playing pawn to b5. Then you try to break up these pawns and if black wants to keep up his extra pawn, they play pawn to c6 and then you trade on b5. It looks like black succeeded in holding on to their extra pawn but queen f3 ruins this idea completely. Now you're attacking the rook, it can go away and black can't avoid material losses. Now here's the cool thing about this trap. Although it might seem like only complete beginners would fall into this well-known trap, in reality the wrong move pawn to c6 is still the most played move up to this date and the average rating of black players is 1500. Not that many players know that there is actually a twin trap that you can use as black against white's first move pawn to d4. You first play pawn to c5 gambiting this pawn because good things come to those who bait. And if your opponent grabs the pawn you then play pawn e6 trying to get it back. As white tries to defend it you then play pawn e5 undermine this pawn. Now by the way how about this pawn takes on a5? Is that an issue? Not really. After that you're gonna get these two pawns back, white is left with weaknesses, you have strong center, life is good. Yes, white's not winning, but you have a really nice position. What if white goes pawn to a3? Is that an issue? Not really. After this trade, white actually blunders this rook on a1, therefore that doesn't help as well. So finally, if white wants to maintain this pawn chain and hold on to their extra pawn, they gotta play pawn to c3, but then after this trade they fall into the very same trap, just with the opposite color. Here's good news, c3 is the most played move by white with the average rank of white players being 1700 and there are hundreds of thousands of games played this way, therefore the trap is indeed very effective. Here's my secret sauce, I'm pretty sure that your opponents aren't familiar with it at all. And here's how you can trap even an advanced level opponent, so you've come to the right place. Join the Igor nation, the nation of chess domination. <laughs> Alright, let's rock. So, we go knight f3 first and we hide our intention a little bit. Now, in most cases your pawns on the first move will either go pawn e5 or pawn to d5, but our knight currently controls this square, taking away that option. Therefore, in most cases your pawns are gonna go pawn to d5. Now we play the same gambit move pawn c4 and good news is in that in this position accepting this gambit pawn is the most played move by black. Alternatively they might be tempted to push the pawn forward and to seize space and we'll talk about both these options. But let's start from the most common one, pawn takes c4. We now play pawn e3 aiming to get this pawn back and just have a better position with better development and greater central control. What if your pawn tries to hold on to this pawn? Initially we follow the same line a4 trying to break up these pawns. If black tries to solidify his pawn structure we end up with this position. And now here comes the difference. You can't play queen to f3 targeting the rook because this square is taken away by the knight. So what do you do then? Well, we have something in mind. You initially play knight to c3 attacking this pawn on b5. And in most cases they're gonna defend it by the bishop this way, bishop d7. Why would they do so? They can't really defend it that way because of the similar tactics to the main trap, knight takes b5. And if they recapture, they're gonna lose this rook on a8 because the pawn is being down to the rook. That's not gonna work for black. What if they try to push forward b4? Well, that fails to queen a4, double attack to the king and this pawn on b4 and after that we'll pick up the other pawn on c4 as well and we'll also get a winning position. So that fails as well. And actually your opponents in most cases are gonna figure this out and they're gonna play bishop d7, defending this pawn that way. And now after knight e5, 7 moves in the game, you've basically won the game already. Now, even with the best play, white still has the advantage here, but in most cases you're gonna win the game on the next move. Because after almost whatever move that black is gonna play here, you're gonna play queen f3, our main trap, attacking the rook, sorry, yeah, attacking the rook, and on top of that, in this position, you're even attacking the pawn on f7. So for instance, if black goes pawn a6 or any other move, queen f3 not only threatens the rook, it also threatens queen takes f7, checkmating 1. And both of these threats are deadly for black, because of our knight that attacks the square just as well. Your attack here is usually even stronger compared to the main queen's gambit trap. Because let's say, okay, instead of e6, for example, they go knight f6, covering this square, right? So currently queen f3 does not hit this pawn, which is better for black, but we still hit the rook and we still win the game. They usually try to play knight to c6 so that instead of losing the rook, they lose a minor piece. But after this exchange, we attack the queen, black takes, we recapture, now it's checked to the king. 
plus we put pressure to the rook, therefore the only move for black is knight to d7. Now you play knight takes b5 and you threaten knight to c7, check to the king, fork to the rook, and it's almost a checkmate. You see that in this line we have greater development and therefore greater chances to develop quick attack. So black wants to cover knight to c7, they're gonna play rook c8, and let's say you drop the queen back to e4. Now this pawn on a7 is hanging, we attack it twice, we're gonna capture it by the knight, and attack this rook, and if they move the pawn forward, they can fail to knight to d6, really nice checkmate. That covers your pawn accepting the gambit pawn. But how about them pushing the pawn forward, trying to take advantage of the fact that you haven't played pawn to d4 yourself, like trying to C space but going pawn to d4. What do you do then? Well, then you play e3 attacking this pawn. And in most cases, black will try to solidify it by going pawn c5. What if they trade on e3? Is that an issue? Not at all. Because if black actually trades on e3, just think about this, they've wasted several moves moving this pawn only to trade it off at the end and they're currently completely passive, right? Well, you have some development already, you're gonna grab the center and certainly you have a superior position here. Therefore, an exchange on e3 is good for you. But they usually are gonna play pawn c5 because they wanted to gain that space advantage. Now you continue undermining his pawn center by going pawn b4. So you wanna take away this pawn so that this pawn is gonna be lost and you will, in any case, will get advantage in the center. On amateur level, the most played move by black is b6, which kind of makes sense, right? They're trying to hold on to their central pawn chain. So they go pawn b6, and if they do so, they're done. So you trade on c5, and then you play the move similar to the previous variation. We go knight to e5, because we want to vacate this square for the queen. And plus our knight also helps to, you know, possibly target certain other squares in your opponent's position. And now it's really, really tough for black, because in the vast majority of the cases they're gonna play some development move, they're gonna fail to this idea queen f3, and they're gonna lose immediately. Even if, for some reason, either because your opponent is super smart or super lucky, they're gonna play the move bishop to b7, and now you can't play queen f3 anymore. So that's basically the only move that can prevent you from doing so. Then we reroute our attack to the queen side, and we play queen a4, check to the king. It turns out that our knight is also doing a good job controlling these two squares, therefore it's not that easy for black to handle this simple check. They're gonna go knight to d7, now the knight is pinned down to the king, and you're putting pressure here with your, king, with your queen and knight, and now you trade on d4, and after that you push the pawn forward to c5, creating a multiple threats. Like, pawn is ready to go forward and to double attack these minor pieces, that's a major threat. Plus, by moving this pawn forward, you open up a diagonal for your bishop, and then you can stack the battery along this diagonal, and black will be done. And also, additionally, your queen is now attacking this pawn on d4, which is a you know less big issue for black, but still, an extra pawn is still nice. And quite often, your pawn is going to play something like you know, pawn f6, let's say, trying to get rid of this knight, and after this trade on d7, you can just continue with bishop b5, and because of this skewer, you are winning the queen and the game. Moreover, it's not even easy for black to lose just the queen, because if, let's say, they trade, you are gonna also win the bishop on b7 and attack the rook, and that is just a complete devastation. If you play the queen's gambit with either white or black side, then you need to understand this opening and know all the main ideas, plans, traps, and common errors of this opening. I've recorded a dedicated video about this. It was watched by almost half a million people already, and I'm pretty sure you'll find it helpful as well. You can click the link right here and check it out.